I'm Natasha Kirchuk, and thanks for joining us from our studios in Israel. Coming up in today's newscast, President Trump initiates new talks for Israeli-Palestinian peace. Jewish groups are up in arms over the end of Dreamers in America, and we'll reveal the only place in Israel where Arafat, Obama, and Rabin are all hanging out. Stay tuned for the latest news in Israel. With the devastating aftermath of Hurricane Harvey still unloading on people all over the Gulf Coast, Floridians are now bracing themselves for Hurricane Irma, which is supposed to be the most powerful Atlantic storm ever on record. Well, now the Israeli embassy has just pitched in to help, sending several tons of aid to help victims in Houston and Louisiana who lost their homes. Israel aid has been on the ground in Houston since the storm unleashed its deadly force all over the coast. And just yesterday, the Israeli government revealed a million dollar aid package to help the ravaged Jewish community get back on its feet. And now this latest aid package is coming straight from the Israeli embassy in Washington, D.C., partnering up with Israel and an American-Israeli moving company called Movers 495. It's all in a move to coordinate tons of aid packages to victims of Hurricane Harvey. A message on the aid boxes read, Israel stands with Texas. The Category 5 Hurricane Irma is officially the most powerful storm ever recorded in the Atlantic. And unfortunately, it's heading straight for South Florida. The governor of Florida has already announced a state of emergency with millions of Floridians preparing to evacuate. Do not sit and wait to prepare. Get prepared now. Yesterday, I declared a state of emergency in all 67 Florida counties to help emergency management officials across the state work together more easily and to ensure that they have all the resources that they need to prepare our communities. This morning, I requested President Trump declare a pre-landfill emergency for the entire state of Florida. I just heard from the White House, and I have been told that President Trump has approved this declaration. This will free up much needed federal funding and assistance as we prepare for Irma. As of 5 o'clock today, I waive tolls, all tolls in the state, which will help our evacuation efforts. South Florida residents are pretty used to hurricanes by now and typically ride out the storms inside of their homes. But even seasoned Floridians are worried that Irma might be a beast of a totally different nature. Israel's foreign ministry has even warned Israeli citizens in Florida to evacuate and clear out the storm's path immediately. Clearly, this isn't a time to take any chances. The U.N. General Assembly is set to convene in just two weeks, and rumors are swirling that President Trump will be taking the opportunity to reboot Israeli-Palestinian peace talks. ILTV's Aaron Porras is here to tell us more. So, Aaron, where are things with the negotiations now? Uh, well, we've seen a lot of effort recently from the Trump administration to restart peace talks. Uh, talk, you know, things fell apart back in 2014. Uh, and ever since then, with the exception of security coordination, there has been pretty much no advancement in peace negotiations whatsoever. Um, especially, you know, and things didn't really get any better uh, with all the skeptic skepticism that was following right. uh, Jared Kushner's visit as envoy to the Middle East, especially since the, the White House had not officially recognized a two-state ideology, nor, uh, nor condemned settlement construction. So um, it's really just... Uh, it, you know, right now we're really just waiting on them to come together. Luckily, Kushner did grease the wheels at least a little bit because they're willing to meet with, with President Trump. Right, Trump is going to be speaking with them one-on-one -on -one right. at the UN General Assembly. Now, is, is it too much to hope that these talks could really go somewhere right now? I mean, it's not it's not too much to hope, but at the same time, it really just depends on whether or not the two sides are willing to come down and sit down and talk. This is not the first time that right. uh, that a president of the United States has come forward with a peace plan. Trump will not be the first. Uh, unfortunately, the way things are going, probably not the last. But again, you know, if he's he's there, the infrastructure to set the peace talk is there. He's going to be meeting with them at the UN. And if Israel and Palestine can come up with something that they can agree on and, and are open, then something could come out of this, sure. All right, so. well, let's check out the details of your report. The American president will meet privately before the assembly with both Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu and Palestinian Authority President Abbas, his first talks with them since May. 
The White House is hopeful about its latest push for peace following the envoy led by Jared Kushner to the region a few weeks ago. While a formal peace plan still needs to be drawn up, which could happen by the end of the year, Kushner's team returned from their Middle East tour feeling encouraged. That's because they were apparently able to sway the Palestinians to remain involved with the talks and coordinated with both Jordan and Saudi Arabia to convince President Abbas that Trump was taking the peace talks seriously. Indeed, Trump campaigned on his promise to land the, quote, ultimate deal between Israel and the Palestinians and visited the region personally last May to meet with leaders from both sides. Now it looks like he'll be having more one-on-ones both before and after the United Nations convenes its General Assembly later this month. This will be President Trump's first meeting with Netanyahu and Abbas since the progress made by Kushner's peace envoy, so we'll just have to wait and see if the ultimate deal is truly on the way. The Trump administration has just made a controversial decision to end a program that protects nearly one million immigrant dreamers. They were brought to America as children, and Jewish groups all over the United States are denouncing the move. They see dreamers the same way that they see their own Jewish relatives who sought refuge in America as immigrants themselves. The program known as the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, or DACA, has protected nearly 800,000 young immigrants from deportation by giving them the ability to work legally in the U.S. in the form of two-year renewable work permits. It's also helped them obtain driver's license and enroll in college. And through DACA, these dreamers have been able to find the hope that they might someday be able to legally immigrate to the United States, the country they've lived in for the majority of their lives. Applicants had to pass a series of vigorous government background checks to be eligible, but now the Trump administration has decided to do away with the project altogether. To have a lawful system of immigration that serves the national interest, we cannot ha admit everyone who would like to come here. It's just that simple. There is an open, that would be an open borders policy, and the American people have rightly rejected that. Congress will now have six months to undo the program, putting the fate of nearly one million dreamers into very unknown territory. Protesters have just broken out in full force all over the country, including Jewish American groups from across the spectrum. The American Jewish Co Committee, the Jewish Community Council of Greater Washington, and the Religious Action Center of Reform Judaism have all blasted the decision, and Jewish leaders and rabbis have called President Trump's decision morally misguided and poor public policy. The demise of DACA comes on the heels of another controversial White House decision to limit or possibly cancer, cancel entirely the J-1 visas to the U.S. This would block thousands of Israelis from being able to study in the United States or work in Jewish summer camps. Now, for a deeper understanding of just what the end of DACA means for some, Joining us right now is Nelly Gonzalez, a dreamer who was in high school applying for college when DACA first launched. Now, thank you so much for talking with us today, Nelly. I know this is difficult. You yourself came to the U.S. when you were very young. So how exactly did your life change when DACA was first announced? My life changed dramatically. Um, I was, you know, a fresh graduating from from high school going on to college. Uh, with that being said, it gave me the opportunity to pursue my dreams and apply for college, uh, get accepted into college. And also not only college, but I was also allowed a work permit. So I immediately after high school started working uh, two, three jobs to pay for my schooling. Um, it also gave me a driver's license. It gave me a social. So um, it, it's a lot that, that changed for me. Absolutely. And I mean, I can't even imagine how you're feeling right now. H how are you feeling? Um, well, yesterday when I got the news, um, I heard the speech and my heart was shattered. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, it's a big disappointment knowing that you gave your life, you came here when you were little. This is your home to not only me, but millions of DACA students. This is what we know. So, uh, you know, it, it's like a country turning their back on you. Um, but we're not here to get sympathy or for people to feel pity for us. Uh, we're here to, you know, work harder and fight stronger for what we believe in and for the country that we call home. So, so what do you say to the people who defend ending DACA, who think America needs to limit immigration or even deport non-legal immigrants, even if they've been in the United States? for a while. 
I think a lot of people who uh, talk negative about DACA students is because they're not fully aware of uh, what DACA is and the situation that surrounds us uh, or what's going on. And we're just like everybody else. We're, uh, you know, we love America just like anybody, any other citizen would. So I would tell them, please open your mind, uh, educate a little, yourself a little about what's really going on um, and open your heart. All right, well, thank you so much for joining us, Nelly, and, and we wish you the best. Yeah, thank you for having me. Moving on, you've probably never heard of it, but just a decade ago, an atomic arms race with Syria was narrowly avoided when Israel destroyed a soon-to-be nuclear reactor deep in the heart of Syrian territory. The Black Op was later named Operation Orchard, and here to relive some of those events is Dr. Martin Sherman, the founder and executive director of the Israel Institute for Strategic Studies. Thank, Thank you. you so much for joining us. Thank you for inviting me. All right, so tell us a little bit about Operation Orchard. Well, in many ways, this is a classic cloak and dagger operation, which could probably fill a number of spy novels, uh, which is basically divided into two sections, the intelligence gathering mm -hmm. and the operational strike. And of course, the operational strike is what got the most headlines, but perhaps the most important is the intelligence gathering, which is a remarkable feat. Uh, you know, they have to first of all detect it, which is something the Syrians were trying uh, to avoid. To clearly hide, right. Yeah. And, and then not only detect it, but gather enough uh, operational intelligence to, A, convince the decision makers, both in Israel and abroad, that a strike was necessary. And, um, well, and it clearly was, and there were political risks involved in doing this as well. Well, there were a number of risks. So first of all, uh, the most basic risk was to the physical safety of the combatants involved. Mm -hmm. They would either be killed or worse, perhaps captured. Uh, they would have probably endangered, would have probably endangered uh, intelligence sources, intelligence methods, operational methods. And there were, of course, the political risks if it had failed. Uh, or it had been proven that this was a, a, a bogus target, mm -hmm. I think there would have been terrific uh, uh, reaction. So here's my question for you. What are the differences on the ground right now between, you know, what took place a decade ago in Syria and future Israeli military actions when it comes to Iran or North Korea? Well, today it's certainly much more complicated. And the reason that it's much more complicated is because of to put it charitably, uh, policy failures both in the U.S. and in Israel. Mm -hmm. I think that the uh, Obama decision to breach a deal with Iran, uh, as, as it was in, in, in 2015, uh, was a tremendous mistake. Uh, it enriched the regime economically, it empowered the military, and it entrenched it politically. So without that agreement, I doubt very much whether Iran could be deployed in Syria today because it was really you know, on the ropes with the, mm -hmm. the economic sanctions. The other, the, other, the other policy failure, I think, was an Israeli policy failure in 2006, where the, the IDF was not given clear an order to capture and destroy Hezbollah and hum in a humiliating defeat, which it could have but didn't. And Hezbollah emerged from that, that conflict with its status enhanced. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think what we're seeing now is we're reaping the bitter fruits of those two policy debacles. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Sherman. There's so much more that we could talk about Definitely. this issue, but I'm, I'm hoping we'll have you back soon. Thank you. All right. Just yesterday, we broke the news that Palestinian police made a very controversial arrest by putting a well-known activist for Palestinian rights behind bars. It was all because he called on President Abbas to resign. Well, now human rights groups all over the world are slamming the Palestinian leader for the attack on free speech, and the jailed activist is going on a hunger strike. Isa Amro is probably the last guy you'd expect President Abbas would throw in jail. As one of the most prominent activists for the Palestinians, he heads an anti-Jewish settlement group in Hebron, coordinates protests against the IDF all the time, and appears on international media. But after criticizing the Palestinian authorities' crackdown on putting journalists in jail, Amro posted on Facebook that Abbas should resign, words which landed him in the slammer. Now Amro is leading another protest from jail, but this time it's not against Israel. It's against the Palestinian Authority for stepping all over free speech. He's just announced a hunger strike to protest his arbitrary arrest, and after nearly two days in jail, he's also protesting the fact that he hasn't even been officially charged with a crime. 
This arrest is the latest controversial move by Abbas's government against his critics, many of which include journalists as well as ordinary Palestinians voicing their frustrations on social media. Rights groups all over the world are condemning Amro's arrest and even the Palestinian people are joining the cry. But it's already very clear that if these arrests continue, Abbas's controversial policy is only going to draw more and more flack. When you're living with depression, it's common to feel alone. So common, in fact, that according to the World Health Organization, over 300 million people worldwide are suffering from symptoms of depression. Well, now there's a revolutionary new treatment that you won't want to miss out on. And here to tell us more about deep TMS treatments is Yaakov Michelin, the CEO of Brainsway, and Professor Abraham Zangin, Brainway's scientific founder. I hope I got your names right there, Omo. Yes. <laughs> all right, so this is amazing. Tell us, first of all, what is deep TMS? Well, deep TMS is a method to deliver magnetic pulses into the brain. And uh, we developed a way to get these pulses deep into the brain, into the relevant areas that are not functioning correctly in states like depression. So how does it work? So it is this uh, helmet is actually connected to a large power supply okay. uh, where a capacitor is discharged into the cable and produces magnetic pulses over the head. So we place the helmet over the head of the uh, patient and uh, the pulses actually stimulate circuitries in the brain that are associated with pathological uh, conditions like depression. Wow, this is, this is extremely interesting. So, okay, this is something that if you wanted to use it, you would use in a hospital, or is it a product that you can buy and, and bring home? So our uh, business model now in uh, the United States, it's our uh, devices are sold or leased to psychiatric clinics okay. all around the U.S. So... So Everyone. I can't put that on if I'm having a Not bad day? Mo more than that, it's very accessible. We have clinics all over. You step into a clinic, uh -huh. you are treated for only 20 minutes, you get out of the clinic, and you go to your daily routine. Interesting. So this, okay, so again, I, I'm, I'm just, it's, it's almost flabbergasting. So essentially, a patient could go in. How long, is a, how long do you have to keep this on? 20 minutes per 20 treatment, minutes. and you have to do it for four weeks, five days a, a, a week, and then you are set after the 20 sessions. Then you have the, either the remission or a very significant response. We did a very large clinical trial. We have an, FD, we have an FDA approval since wow. the beginning of 2014, and we treated over 15,000 patients already. Right. Okay, so where is it currently available? All over the U.S. All over the U.S.? You can just log on into our website. Not in Israel yet? No, in Israel we also have it, okay. but we are really launching it in Israel. In the next coming weeks, we will do a large uh, launch campaign and it will be also spread all over Israel. And until now, we focus mainly on the, in the U.S. Now, I, I mean, my final question for you, and we are running out of time, so I'm probably getting in trouble for this, is uh, what kind of patients can use this? I mean, is this somebody who has chronic depression, or is it, I mean, yeah, so, how, how do you target who so is eligible? Basically, basically, any patient suffering from depression can, can be treated, but the, usually the patients who did not respond to medications mm -hmm. are the ones that will come, or those who will suffer too much side effects of the medications will come. It can also be an alternative for electroshock therapy, because the basic concept of this, of this actually method is to stimulate the relevant brain regions while, you know, the old way of using shock therapy, which was very effective but have side effects, right. is causing all these terrible side effects, and this is actually targeting the relevant circuitry. So it's a safer alternative. Much safer. All right, well, thank you both so much for coming in, and I hope that anybody who deals with depression um, keeps these guys in mind. Okay. Thank, thank you. you, Natasha. Yuppie, we're done. So, well, everyone's favorite karma chameleon is back after reuniting with Culture Club. Boy George and his band are set to return and rock out in Tel Aviv later this year. The pop icon is the voice behind some of the all-time greatest 80s classics, which means he'll be bringing a little retro back to the holy land. Boy George is no stranger to the Israeli stage. He helped open Gay Pride Week in Eilat a few years ago and performed a solo show back in 2010. But this will be the first time playing with the rest of Culture Club in Israel since their breakup over 30 years ago. There are almost too many Culture Club classics to name the war song, time, and of course, you really want to hurt me, which means this year's set list will be one to remember. The band rocked out in Tel Aviv back in 1985, a show that the band recalls as especially memorable for them to play. 
Tickets are already on sale and expected to sell very fast, so you better grab yours unless you actually want to hurt boy George. Yasser Arafat, Albert Einstein, and Barack Obama meet in a small apartment in Tel Aviv. Sounds like the beginning of a bad joke, right? Well, it turns out it actually isn't. These men may not have actually congregated here together, but their portraits certainly have. So let's take a look. But first, let me ask you a question. What's the most appropriate way to react to getting turned down from a job? אני הולך לחפש עבודה, מתברר, מי שלמד עד כיתה ה' ולא שירת בצה"ל, לא מתקבל לעבודה. אז מה אני עושה? אז החלטתי במקום לזעום ולקטר, החלטתי לתעד מפסיפס את כל אלה שפיטרו אותי מעבודה, והם לידי כל יום, אני אומר להם תודה רבה שפטרתם אותי מעבודה 40 שנה. This is Yosef Lugasi, and he's a ceramic artist. He immigrated to Israel all the way from Morocco when he was a kid, but he was forced to drop out of school to help his family financially. Here's the thing, though. You don't need a formal education to be a world-class artist. All what you see here is 990 dukes from the world. This is the biggest in the world. There is no place in the world where there are 990 dukes from the world of the world. 40 years. That's how long it's taken Yosef Lugasi to transform his small apartment into a massive work of mosaic art. That's right, this isn't a museum. It's his home. בית פרטי, באים מבקרים לפה, וכל מה שהספקתם לראות זה בזכות יפה אשתי. הכרנו במועדון לילה. איך שראיתי אותה, נדלקתי עליה. רדפתי אחריה, רדפתי אחריה עד יבנה. And it's Yafa who's continued to finance their family by working at an electric company as Yosef focuses on his art. Yes, we changed the work of the children. He worked with the children and I went to work. I worked with the children and he helped me to work with 990 children. It's the faces of the planet's most powerful leaders that line the walls of the Lugasi household. I don't go to politics, I go to all kinds of stories that I find in the Shuk Apishbishi, stories that I find. But here's the craziest part. All of the portraits are made out of junk, literally. Yosef collects old tiles, rocks, and shells that have been thrown out in the local neighborhood to make his masterpieces. So whose face is going to be recreated next at the Lugasi household? הוא מתייעץ איתי, מתייעץ עם הילדים, את מי כדאי עכשיו לעשות, את מי ליצור. אבל למעשה נגמרו כבר המנהיגים, צריך ליצור. Well, maybe there's a spot for me. All right, well, if you guys are interested in visiting the Lugasi household, it's in Yafo, Tel Aviv. Tours are free, and they come with free juice and cookies. Enroll in eTeacher's online Hebrew courses and quickly discover that it creates the deepest connection to Israel that you could ever imagine. And now for our Hebrew word of the day. It seems like every other day someone discovers a new mosaic in the Holy Land. So today's word is going to be sifas, meaning mosaic. Whether it's hundreds of years old and found in a cave in Jerusalem or made of recycled trash and displayed in your home, a sifas or mosaic can be found everywhere. Sif Sifasim, or mosaics, come in all different colors, are made of all different materials, and show all sorts of amazing imagery. Some sifasim portray history, people, animals, or daily life. Some tell stories, and some are just beautiful and enjoyable to look at. And believe me, all you have to do is pay attention, and you're bound to find a psifas. All right, now let's go ahead and take a look at the weather forecast. That was a hard word. Tonight should be clear to partly cloudy with a drop in temperatures to a low of 75 or 24 degrees Celsius. Tomorrow is expected to be clear with no change in temperatures from today and a high of 86 or 30 degrees Celsius. 
All right, that's it for today's news. Today's exchange rate is 3.56 shekels to the American dollar. Remember to sign up for our daily newsletter at ILTV.tv. I'm Natasha Kirchuk, and thanks for watching.